an elite force of Norwegian resistance fighters returned to their invaded homeland to carry out one of the most daring and significant acts of sabotage in World War II. Their target is the world's largest hydroelectric power plant in Nazi-occupied Norway. The Allies know that Hitler could use it to produce heavy water, a key component in the ultimate weapon of the war, an atomic bomb. The plant must be destroyed. But it won't be easy. In the harshest winter on record, they must survive, strike, then evade capture crossing 250 miles of enemy territory. Success could halt Hitler's atomic program, but for the raiders, the mission itself may be suicidal. In World War II, some of the most astonishing military raids changed the tide of history. Now, we tell these stories in a way that has never been possible before, using state-of-the-art graphics, expert analysis, live weapon and explosive demos, and first-person accounts from the men who made history. We forensically examine exactly how these actions unfolded, minute by minute. We can now discover whether it was skill, clever tactics, or just luck that carried the day. Seven hundred feet above the icy Hardanger Plateau in southern Norway, an elite squad of six, all Norwegians who have escaped the Nazis, are about to embark on the most dangerous mission of their lives. They're returning to their occupied homeland on an ultra-classified raid. The drop has been timed for tonight's full moon. It will give them the best chance of locating the landing area. But there's a problem. Severe ice and snow has obscured the landscape. And now, they can't find the drop zone. On April 9th, 1940, the Nazis invaded the neutral Scandinavian country of Norway. Within just 48 hours, they occupied almost every major city, town, and airfield. Crucially, they also took control of the world's largest hydroelectric power plant. The hydroelectric plant at Bermork was unique because it produced heavy water, which is one of the critical elements in building nuclear weapons. As soon as the Allies realized that the Nazis had taken the hydroelectric plant, they were worried that Hitler was trying to build an atomic bomb British intelligence had heard that the Nazis had ordered production of heavy water to be substantially increased. No one has built an atomic bomb, but scientists know it is possible. Making heavy water requires a lot of water and electricity, and the hydro plant has plenty of both. But the Allies don't want Hitler to get there first. The success of the raid was enormously important. Stopping Hitler getting an atomic bomb was absolutely critical if the Allies had any hope of winning World War II. Leading this critical mission is Second Lieutenant Joachim Ronneberg. In 1941, he escaped Norway, crossing the North Sea in a small fishing boat to Britain. To live in an occupied country is very distressing, and you have to experience it to understand. We felt that there was no sacrifice too great to get the Germans out. You have to fight for your freedom and for peace. At just 23, he's one of the youngest of the group, selected because of his sabotage and demolition experience. Underneath their snowsuits, 
Ronneberg and his men may look like an ordinary force, but they're special operatives armed for secret sabotage. They carry 36 half-pound plastic explosive charges, 10 Mills bombs, commonly known as hand grenades, chloroform to disarm the enemy silently, cyanide in case of capture, wire cutters, Thompson submachine guns, and Colt 45 pistols. The Colt has a seven round magazine. It's easy to cock and has a simple thumb operated safety catch. It's a beautifully manufactured weapon. The men might be armed and ready, but they can't find the landing zone. If they jump in the wrong place in extreme conditions, the whole mission could fail. If they don't jump now, they'll have to wait another month until the next full moon. Delaying this raid is an advantage they can't afford to give Hitler. We were not convinced the correct lake had been identified, but as the drop was vital, Ronneberg decided not to delay. It's a critical but extremely risky decision that could end in disaster. So all the six brave young men and their packages were dropped. Their drop zone should be near Svensbu by Lake Saura, 20 miles from the hydro plant. Until they get their bearings, they don't know if they're in the right place, but at least they've landed safely. Ronneberg's men aren't alone on this mission. They'll be met by this four-man advance party who have been living undercover and gathering intelligence on the Veamork hydro plant for the past five months. Between them, they intend to put Hitler's heavy water production out of action. Ten men will have to navigate over 20 miles of inhospitable enemy terrain. Cross a deep icy gorge and dodge bullets from the heavily armed guards on the bridge. They'll have to avoid four machine gun posts and break through the heavily mined perimeter. Once inside, they must use plastic explosives to detonate 18 heavy water canisters. They face being caught by as many as 30 guards at the site, who in turn can alert over 200 troops at the nearby garrison, just four miles away. If they get out alive, they'll have to avoid capture on their 250 mile journey to safety in Sweden. The special operatives hit the ground and spring into action. This might be their homeland, but now it's enemy territory. Nazi soldiers could be anywhere. They must hide all traces of their landing to avoid detection. Ronneberg's section must cross back-breaking terrain to reach their target. They have kept supplies to a minimum and carry only the weapons they need for the attack itself. We would need the most powerful weapons possible because we imagined we would have to fight our way into the plant and out again. We chose the Tommy guns and Colt revolvers partly because they used the same ammunition, but also because they were really good stopping weapons. The guns they've chosen are devastating at short range, perfect for the raid, but they won't help them in their trek across the wide open enemy terrain. Any Germans patrolling the area would most likely outgun them. If the special forces operatives are seen, they won't stand a chance. 
The KAR-98 was a German bolt-action Mauser. It was based on a simple World War I design and was the German soldier's basic weapon. With a bolt action, it fires rounds at a speed of over 2,000 feet per second and is effective up to 800 yards. It has a much longer range and accuracy than anything Ronneberg's men carry. The Raiders are ready to move forward. There's just one problem. There's no sign of the rendezvous party. They realize they've landed off course. They're near Skricken, but that is some 18 miles northwest of the intended drop zone in Svensbu. It's the middle of the night, minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit, and the six soldiers are stranded deep behind enemy lines. All they can do is press on and hope they don't run into a Nazi patrol. The squad sent to destroy Hitler's atomic ability has landed behind enemy lines, nearly 20 miles from the intended rendezvous point with their advance team. It's a bone chilling minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. And if the men stay still, the cold will kill them before the Germans can. In the Svensbu hut, the four man advance squad receive radio communication from HQ. They're told the exact whereabouts of their friends is unknown as they were dropped blindly. Despite the risk to their own lives, they decide to go out and search for the others. Their leader is experienced mountaineer, Jens Anton Poulsen. As a young man, my main interests were hunting, fishing, outdoor life. I knew the mountains and I knew the area. He's from the nearby town of Rukan and as a child grew up in the shadow of the target. Poulsen's team have already been here for five months, gathering as much intelligence about their target as possible. But he knows all their efforts will be in vain if they can't find the sabotage party. This mission can only be completed with all 10 men. But Poulsen's men are in Svensbu, nearly 20 miles southeast from the rendezvous party, who've landed in Skricken. Ronneberg's team have been trekking for hours over inhospitable terrain to try to get back on track. Every man carries a heavy backpack loaded with weapons, explosives, outdoor equipment, and weeks of rations. In total, they each carry over 55 pounds. But despite the burden of their heavy packs, they must be stealthy. They are under constant threat of being spotted by German patrols. But these men thrive under pressure. Handpicked to set Europe ablaze, the Special Operations Executive are the best of the best. Volunteers in Winston Churchill's secret army. Special Operations Executive was comprised of agents intended to go behind enemy lines and to cause as much destruction as possible. They had to be trained in disguise, in sabotage, and in special instances, they could be used to target new technologies. SOE was actually recruited internationally. People could be planted back again into their home countries. This meant they would have much better chance of blending in and moving around without being discovered. Ronneberg selected his team for this mission, and he knows that in situations like this, he has the right men by his side. A small elite team means it's easier to infill and achieve an element of surprise without being bumped. However, if they are spotted, they'll be outnumbered and there's little chance of avoiding capture. Ah! 
in Svensbu, the rendezvous search party follows experienced skier Klaus Helberg. He fought in the Norwegian resistance and was a prisoner of war before escaping and fleeing to Stockholm, capital of neutral Sweden, where he joined the SOE. Now he uses his local knowledge to scour the landscape for the missing men. Twice we were out looking for them, but they didn't find us. Then a storm arose, a heavy storm. This storm was much worse than any we had experienced so far. It could have been it for them. As the storm hits, the men have to retreat to base. After enduring five months in one of the worst winters on record, they are in danger themselves. We had some food left, not much from our rations, but that was soon empty. And then we had no food, no food at all. With no choice but to wait the violent storm out, Polson's men focus on the mission at hand. We had three tasks. One was to establish contact with people who could give us some information on the production of heavy water, what the Germans are doing. The other was to keep up the radio communication with England. And the third was to stay alive. Despite the raging storm, the missing party are alive, thanks to a lucky discovery. A mountain hut, traditionally used by walkers for shelter. We didn't even see the hut, we just walked into it. We were very, very lucky. But now they're trapped in their hideaway, by 70 miles per hour winds. You felt as if the whole cabin was going to be lifted off the ground. They try to press on, but every time they leave the hut, they are forced back. Three days later, things get even worse. The snowstorm rages with renewed power. Visibility, zero. The general lassitude of all members of the party was evident, and two men were seriously ill. Survival is as much to do with psychological as well as physical strength. Keeping composure, high spirits, and a sense of solidarity with your comrades is vital. After nearly a week, the storm finally lifts. Ronneberg and his men move east towards the advance party. The exhausted squad trek for hours. They're almost within reach of Svensbu. But as they approach the final hill, two figures loom on the horizon. Their white snowsuits make it impossible to tell if they are friend or foe. Quickly taking cover, the team prepares for a firefight with their Thompsons cocked and ready for action. This is the M1 Thompson submachine gun. It's an American gun, designed in World War I as a trench buster. This weapon is a punchy little number. Fires a 45 caliber round. Doesn't necessarily have the range, but in close quarter battles, it'll do the job and put someone down. It's solid and reassuringly heavy. You know you've got a weapon in your hand when you hold this, and it feels right. 
when you release, it fires well. It's solidly put together, and it's the sort of weapon you'd want with you on the battlefield. But this is no ordinary battlefield. They'll have to choose what to do next. Stay quiet and try not to be spotted, or hope their short-range weapons are enough to win them the firefight. The highly trained unit wait for the strangers to come within range. When suddenly, a call rings out. A wild yell told us we were in touch with the reconnaissance party. We didn't expect to meet them there, so we were very surprised to have met our friends. When we saw them, we knew them all. They were friends from training in Scotland, and we hadn't seen other people for weeks, months. And now we were there chatting, talking, laughing. It was a meeting I will never forget. Reunited, the men return to the Svensbu hut. Finally, the advance party gets to enjoy a much-needed meal. They had rations we hadn't tasted for months. We had a good meal that night. It was fun to talk with friends who had news to tell. We had lived alone in the mountains, and the change was welcome. Now the elite commandos have just four days to make final preparations. Our chances of being trapped were very great indeed, and so we had a long discussion about our best plan for retreat. We knew that this was going to be serious, and that we might not come through it. For missions like this, you need detailed and intricate knowledge of the target. The best way to get that intel is eyes on the ground. It's very effective, but it's extremely dangerous. Fortunately for the men, there is another member of the team, Einar Skinnerland, willing to risk his life for inside information. Skinnerland was a Norwegian refugee who had fled to England after the Nazis occupied Norway. The SOE grabbed him up, gave him a quick amount of training, and then 11 days after he had arrived in England, dropped him back in Norway to be an operative at the plant and send back vital information for the raid. I am quite certain there was not one operation during the war with such good information and knowledge of the target as we had on ours. Based on Einar's invaluable intel, the elite force have another advantage. An exact replica of the heavy water room in their HQ. They have tirelessly rehearsed laying the explosives on the model canisters. Each man has also memorized drawings, photographs, and maps of the plant. None of us had been to the plant in our lives, but by the time we left Britain, we knew the layout of it as well as anyone. After months of preparation, their moment has come. The raiding party moves towards their target. It takes some time to get used to the idea that this is probably the last thing you'll do. But that's the difference, I think, between the people in the free world of Britain or America. You were never occupied. We knew what occupation was, and we fought against it. And we fought against it willingly. This is an almost impossible mission, but it is made even more dangerous by the fact that an attempt to destroy the plant has been made before. Operation Gunnerside was actually not the first attempt to sabotage Hitler's nuclear weapons program. The glider assault, codenamed Operation Freshman, failed. 
The gliders landed in the wrong place and the British soldiers were actually captured by the Germans. Under Hitler's commando order, all of those British soldiers were executed. The Nazis also discovered maps and information left in one of the gliders that clearly showed the Mork was their target. This attempt at blowing up the plant was much more dangerous than the first because the Germans now knew that the British were coming. The plant is now more fiercely guarded than ever. In addition to a new detachment of guards, there are four new anti-aircraft guns. Recently installed searchlights sweep the ground around the plant looking for invaders. And that ground is heavily planted with mines. The men make it to the morgue. But to reach the plant, they must first cross a narrow bridge nearly 100 yards long. The German guards who patrol it are armed with the MP40 machine pistol. This is the classic German submachine gun, affectionately known by the Allies as the Schmeiser. It was built for resilience. It needed to work in all environments, and this did. The MP40 fires 30 9mm parabellum rounds. It fires automatically, but if you depress the trigger very carefully, you can actually squeeze off singular rounds. The Allied troops prize this weapon, and they take any opportunity to take it off the battlefield and use it for themselves. Not only are the German guards heavily armed, but if the raiding party is exposed, the enemy can be reinforced at a moment's notice. If the unit is discovered, German reinforcements from Rukon would race to the plant's aid, meaning that they would be vastly outnumbered and outgunned. Hoping for a last chance to avoid the bridge, the best climber, Sergeant Helberg, is sent to scout further down the ravine. I was rather skeptical. I was afraid it wasn't possible to cross. I ought to have gone, and I remember it well because I had a bad conscience about it. It was a great risk to take. The ice-covered ravine is a sheer drop that's over 250 feet deep. It's a route that even the Germans have judged impassable. The ice on the river is breaking up, making a crossing even more difficult. But 200 yards from the bridge, Helberg's local knowledge has paid off. I found the place where it was possible to get down to the gorge. It was a risk. Under the cover of darkness, the raiders decide to attempt the impossible. To stand a chance of making it up the icy ravine, the men have to be as light as possible. They've even removed their snowsuits. Now in the uniform of British soldiers, the Norwegians move forward carrying just their weapons and explosives. The weather was fading dramatically. The wind was blowing, the snow was melting. They'll need to use every ounce of concentration. One wrong move, and they could plummet to the icy ravine below. The whole time we heard the humming from the target, hoping that in about two hours' time it would be quiet. If we had good luck. The men succeed in climbing the route that the Nazis had deemed impassable. 
They make it to the other side exhausted, but for a moment, relieved. It was a wonderful feeling, actually, because you had been thinking of this, and you had been focusing on Vemorg for many months, and you knew that now we have a chance of getting inside the factory. A few hundred yards ahead of them lies the forbidding seven-story Vemorg plant. The hydroelectric plant at Veyermork was crucially important because it produced heavy water. The heavy water could be used in the production of plutonium, an atomic weapon. That work had to be stopped. But the heavy water is stored in the high concentration room at the heart of the heavily guarded compound. Thanks to intelligence from insider Einar Skinnerland, they know where the guards are and when they swap over sentry duty. When we advanced, I think a couple of hundred yards, there was a shed and we waited there because we knew when there was a guard on the bridge, they were relieved. So we waited until Rönneberg gave the order. As expected, at midnight the guards change. But Ronneberg doesn't give the order to advance. He won't move his men until the new sentries are less alert. So now, it's a waiting game. After 45 minutes in freezing temperatures, Ronneberg gives the signal. They advance towards their objective. Paulson's covering party takes the lead. It's their job to break in and set up defensive positions inside the plant. The gate leading into the factory area was locked by a chain, but we have a wire cutter. So we could cut off the chain and go into the area just close to the factories. The covering party took up their pre-planned positions. Haukeli and I, for instance, advanced up to, I think, 20 yards from the guard hut. There was something we could hide behind there. They're all carrying chloroform in their pockets to silently overwhelm any guards they might come across. It's essential they remain undetected, and no one gives them away. Between them, they are armed with five Tommy guns with 10 magazines, seven Colt 45s with 40 magazines, 10 hand grenades, and two separate sets of explosive chargers and fuses. The weapons they've chosen are all short range, so if they come up against an enemy with heavy weapons, they'll have little chance of winning a firefight. With their covering party in place, the four-man explosives team advance towards the basement where the heavy water cells are positioned. But when leader Ronneberg reaches the basement, he's stopped in his tracks. We tried first the door in the cellar, then the next door on the first floor, down again to the cellar door. It was all quite impossible. The door, which they were informed would be open, is locked. Being an elite operative isn't just about physical and mental stamina. It's also about being able to think on your feet and somehow find a way forward when things don't go your way. In these situations, that sense of initiative and never say die attitude can be the difference between success and failure. One thing's for sure, they can't go back. Ronneberg knows that time is their enemy. Every second they stand still increases the chance of discovery. He directs two of the men to look for an alternative entry. And he moves east with Sergeant Kayser. As a last resort, they decide to try an overhead conduit carrying power cables. We crept in on this tunnel, 
and having come halfway in, it got very, very narrow, and there was no chance of turning around. Out by the guard huts, the covering party stay on high alert as they count down the minutes since they last saw their comrades. In the conduit, Ronneberg and Kaiser are approaching their target, the high concentration room where the heavy water canisters are kept. We came to the opening and looked through the window and saw a Norwegian workman. He was reading the instruments and writing the log. They can't risk being spotted, but they must press on with the operation. We managed to get down and open the door and said, hands up. They are in the plant, but the rest of the team are not there. The other group have difficulty finding the entrance for the tunnel. So Ronneberg and his men begin laying out the charges themselves. They are using plastic explosive. It's the perfect material for the job. In the heavy water chamber, Ronneberg and Kayser are halfway through laying out the charges when they're disturbed. The window out to the yard suddenly broke. And I saw my covering man pointing his gun immediately at the window. Ronneberg's luck may have just run out. The Norwegian team has successfully gained entry to the Nazis' heavy water plant. If they can destroy it, they remove any possibility of Hitler developing an atomic bomb. But as they begin laying demolition charges, glass shatters above them. Fortunately, it's just the other members of the explosives party breaking a window to get to them. The question now is did the sound of breaking glass alert the Germans? In a drastic move, Ronneberg decides to shorten the fuses by three quarters. When we made up the ignition sets, we should have had two minute delays, but we decided to put 30 second fuses on so that we could hear the bang as soon as possible and be certain that we had done the job. But this gives them less time to get out. Taking a personal risk to ensure a mission is completed takes strong leadership. In these situations, that sense of initiative and never say die attitude can be the difference between success and failure. The Raiders have just 30 seconds to get out of the basement and out of the path of the explosion. concentration room explodes. One and a half tons of heavy water floods out. But the explosion has finally alerted the guards. The mission target may have been reached but getting out alive is another story. Paulson has the guard in his sights, but he knows he's not there to kill Germans. His restraint saves the group. The guard walks back to his hut, and no one else is alerted. Ronneberg deliberately leaves a gun, tools, and papers behind. To avoid reprisals, he wants the Germans to think that this was a British job. 
the elite force makes a rapid exit. We climbed down the same way, down to the riverbed. It was very steep, but we went very quickly. The snow had blown away, and the ground was frozen, so we left no marks at all. The men make it over the ravine just as the Nazis discover the destroyed heavy water chamber. As they look back towards the plant, they can't believe their luck. There were soldiers down there. They were on their way to Via Morik to take us, of course. We followed a parallel road to the main road, and the whole time we could look down on the road below and see all the traffic. Over 200 German soldiers are deployed from a nearby garrison to scour the landscape. But the intrepid saboteurs disappear without a trace into the tundra. Against the odds, they have negotiated some of the most inhospitable terrain, stopped Hitler's atomic weapons program in its tracks, evaded capture, and made it to safety. Half of the team dissolve undercover, while the rest make a dash for Sweden, 250 miles away. Now we came to neutral Sweden, and I remember we were sort of punching, pinching each other to be quite certain that we were not dreaming. The success of the mission is a classic example of the element of surprise and doing something audacious and unexpected. Reconnaissance party leader Jens Anton Poulsen returned to Norway, where he trained hundreds for the home forces. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Order for his crucial part in the mission. Klaus Helberg was given the Military Medal and became a living legend in Norway. Just a week before he died at the age of 84, he even led a party of skiers along the same route the saboteurs had taken 60 years earlier. Sabotage leader Joachim Ronneberg continued to carry out attacks on vital German installations. After the war, he became a broadcaster known as the Voice of Norway. He was also awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal. Their mission was judged a complete success. 3,000 pounds of heavy water had been destroyed, along with the equipment needed to make it. The real significance of this mission became fully clear when atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of the war. If the Germans had won the race and got nuclear weapons first, the result could have been unthinkable. The decision to use atomic weapons against Japan in 1945 effectively ended the war. The raid on Vermork destroyed Hitler's heavy water production. We now know Hitler never seriously planned to build an atomic bomb, but the Allies didn't know that at the time. The suicidal mission destroyed its target without losing a single man, making Operation Gunnerside one of the greatest raids of World War II.